Hey, today is December 11th, 2017, and you are listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 69. We're all adults here. No jokes, please. Today on Human Factors Cast, we have everything from consequences of ransomware, dilemmas about delivery robots, and our favorite, VR. If you got a PSVR, strap it on now, because Human Factors Cast is coming to you live. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. I guess we're not technically live because this is a pre-recorded show, but welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today, as always, by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. You know, it is pre-recorded, but it feels live to me, so we're going with this Human Factors cast live on a Monday night. You know what, Blake? It's live between you and me, at least. Yes, it's true. You, me, and anybody else who listens to it. My cat. Know, just you and me. My cat who's <laughs> sitting on the on the couch behind me. Yeah, she's listening to it live as well. Uh, oh, she go. just she just left. She, she doesn't like Human Factors. All right. So, man, I, I want to know what's going on in Blake's world. Oh, man. So... In honor of certain events that are coming up, a.k.a. the Star Wars film, oh, man. Uh, plus me being sick over the weekend, Elise and I kind of hung out and just watched a bunch of Star Wars movies, inclu- including Force Awakens, uh, New Hope, and then Rogue One a bunch of times. And so, <laughs> so. My, my first question is, and you didn't invite me. Uh, Well, I would not want you to be sitting around with us while we're blowing our noses and drinking too much tea because we were both sick as dogs. I could have been right there with you because I am also sick, and I just wanted to apologize to any of our listeners who may be able to detect it in my voice. Uh, I've been sneezing and and, uh, being all stuffy all day. So so you watched Star Wars movies this weekend? Yes, yes, okay. And I have one thing to gripe about, and it's it's unbelievable that in 2017 we still have I still have so many problems with DVD and Blu-ray menus, like the between knowing where I am on the menu or having to you know it's kind of a complex interaction only because it's not just the the menu design's fault it's like how it interacts with my Xbox or whatever I'm using sure. to play DVDs, but oh my goodness man it it's no surprised that i've gone digital with so many things because it makes it easier to figure out like how to play how to stop all that kind of stuff it was just driving me insane watching some of the uh some of the dvds over the weekend yeah man i feel you and i'm gonna be right there with you this week so i'll get to see firsthand um just how bad these uh these uis are because i mean i i completely know what you're saying and i've thought about them but only in passing and this is such like a weird interesting um unique sort of niche area right these these blu-ray it's almost seems like an afterthought how do people navigate through it because it's just like well they'll figure it out they'll they'll brute force their way through they'll find the movie they'll find the special features that they're looking for but it, it doesn't mean it's necessarily easy oh yeah and the worst part for me is more so the uh the like the f- getting back to the title menu if I'm restarting, uh, and that's that's definitely more of an I- Xbox interaction, I'm sure. But there's just like some weird things about like stopping and starting, and then if you like, uh, I don't know, if you want to play the DVD from the beginning, it'll remember the data from the last time it was played. So you oh, like, yeah. do that weird interaction of going through the chapters. I don't know. You it know, was just kind of driving me insane, this, so I figured I'd rant about it here. So I don't even have this in the show notes, but this kind of spawned an idea in me. Um I so for me uh when one sort of gripe that I have is um this idea that uh or 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 sort of the the construction of the PlayStation controller if you set it down in just the right way the triggers will go and that's forward and back right yes so, oh my goodness you have that same problem too they wouldn't do that yeah i know or or at least you know detect when there's got to be some there's got to be something like an accelerometer plus that uh the the controls anyway i want to, uh, i so was that it was the blu-ray uh i've got one more thing and i just okay. i don't know I, I would love to hear from our listeners about this if they feel the same way so i like i said i have a lot of stuff that i just buy digitally like 
just so I don't have a physical copy, but certain things like I like to buy special editions. Like I have a special edition, like uh, Star Wars set of DVDs, right? And I was I open the box like probably a couple times a year and just binge watch all of them. But I was looking through it, and you know, digital copies of stuff are just never really gonna. F- give you the same experience in my opinion because this like comes with some different sets of poster art from back in the 80s and late 70s it's just got like of course it's got the in feature stuff but i mean the case itself is just awesome and it's a hard case i don't know it was one of those things that i found myself thinking like do people like still like buying physical copies of things or has everybody gone digital or do you do one or the other for specific reasons. Yeah, no, I, I I hear you there. And I definitely am starting to rack up a digital collection. Uh, but it will be those classics and, and sort of the, uh, the collectible pieces that I will still collect in physical form just for that experience where I can say, yes, I own this. As long as I have some sort of ancient player, I can put this on my TV, right? As long as I have the technology. Whereas digital, it's always kind of floaty to me like yes i own this but technically amazon owns it and they're licensing it to me and like i mean you know it's under my name but should amazon ever go down you know like then it's not i i don't have it so i i'm in this weird space right now where i'm kind of adjusting to the whole uh digital culture but i'm i'm slowly but surely building up my library most definitely, yeah, and I'm I'm in like a whole bucket of mess because I've got digital collectware, right? Like I've got some on iTunes and then some on Amazon. So if yeah. either one goes down, I lose a, a fair amount of content. I feel you, man. So keeping in with the Star Wars thing, if there's two things I love, it's human factors and it's Star Wars. And longtime listeners of the show know this, but I wanted to take a minute to talk about the struggle of spoiler culture and sort of what kind of user experience I've been having for the last week. Uh, So, Blake, you probably noticed around Thursday of last week, I stopped posting. (laughs) I stopped posting news stories in our feed uh, predominantly because I stopped uh, going online. I am completely disconnected at this point reason being is the uh, aside from soundcloud just to upload this episode the, the, and to view the show notes here no fear of being spoiled right and it all comes down line and it's not even in a star wars context where they get spoiled right it's like game uh, at the time the force awakens came out and i'm not going to spoil that movie just been completely shut off even to the point where i bought a face mask and earplugs to wear who are watching it currently to come out and so as soon as I see somebody come out, my earplugs are going in. My uh, And I know this can sound like some sort of crazed fandom, but it's it's just been, just to see like initial reaction, of course, right? But the trusted people who I know won't spoil it didn't read on some of this. Uh, but also just to not like not interacting with the Internet is such a weird thing. Oh, yeah, especially like people like I even saw tweets last week about a couple of game developer that it would right it just still it ruin counts. it for me so it's hard to escape it and getting off the internet like you did at work of course but like trying to do it outside of your life i don't know anything from like newsletters oh, to just like shoot. tweets or whatever you gotta like basically just turn your phone off and hope that you don't hear anything about it you... especially for something as big as like star wars or oh, any man. kind of big uh friend you just do this but our listeners could potentially tweet us and uh, any spoilers but, you know, I got to turn off all the notifications. That's one other thing that, like, I still get notifications from, like, Slack just so that you and I are in communication and that I can hear from our listeners, which I'll get into it for a sec, uh, in a sec. But, you know, it's, it's, I got to turn those things off, man, because, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that even when you're not even looking for it, it, it can pop up. And it's just been, it's just been a crazy experience all around. Um, so. Uh, with that being said, uh, I, I do want to give a quick programming note for next week. Blake, you are traveling, uh, so we'll be pre-recording next week's episode. So if you're looking for um, any impressions of the movie, well, you're not going to find them here, keeping with that uh, spoiler-free uh, <laughs> sort of view. Um, and I think we're going to take uh, the, the the following week off. It's Christmas here in the States, and uh, you know we're, we're going to spend some time with our family. So... Uh, Next week will be a pre-recorded show where we're going to get into uh, uh, a bunch of it came from Reddit specials, uh, potentially some crowdsourced things from the Slack, as well as 
uh, recapping our predictions from 2017 or, or for 2017, and we'll be uh, predicting forward into the future for 2018. This is just to give you a little sneak peek of what's going up. Uh, but I want to get into one of the comments that uh, Brian McDee in our Slack brought up this week. Um, and we always love hearing from you guys. And and, and uh, this comment just kind of, I don't know. I, I like this comment, Blake. I'm going to read it here on the show, and then we'll kind of go over what our responses were because I feel like it's it's important to bring to the masses. Uh, I, I think know you're right. Go on, man. I, I, I know we're going a little long with the intro, but we, we have enough to talk about today. Uh, so... Brian McDee says, hey, guys, just finished the last episode. Took me a while. Busy week. Love the advice of being willing to fail. I've heard before that you cannot be innovative without risking failure. Uh, following best practices and what people did before is fine, but you'll never exceed anything done before without taking risk. Um, also, random thought. I know you guys don't like to mention brand names, but I also fi- al- but I always find that extra nugget interesting. Also, I know you don't want to be political, in quotes, uh, but politics is part of life, so I really just appreciate uh, you talking about net neutrality. Uh, Just my random thoughts. And so, again, thank you, Brian, for writing in. Uh, Blake and I both had our own little thoughts on this, and I thought we'd kind of recap them here because Brian brought up some good points here with uh, mentioning brand names and uh, being political on the show. And I just... I, again, I like pulling back the curtain for our listeners, letting you guys know what's going through our minds as we're podcast hosts and, uh, you know, our voices are being heard around the country and the world, uh, which is weird. But <laughs> just you know, knowing that we have a global audience, we have a lot of uh, sort of responsibility to um, not mention uh, brand names just because we don't want to make you guys or, or give you guys the impression that we are sort of sneaking in a paid advertisement. And I've heard that on other programs before, and it's it's a sneaky tactic. Uh, we're not trying to sell you anything. If we mention it on the show, it's purely because we either had a positive or negative experience with the product. Um, we you know we we do bring these things to you ad free because we don't want to. We want to own it ourselves. We don't want it to be a byproduct of uh, influence from another product. Um, with that being said, you know, I think, I think we do a pretty good job of not, you know, tooting anyone's horn too much. Uh, you know, occasionally you'll get the Google story or the Amazon story or whatever, but you know, we, we try our best. Sometimes they are just in the zeitgeist. As far as politics goes, um, you know, in general terms, we try not to touch on them, um, just because there's so much stuff going on right now. It's, you come to Human Factors Cast a little bit for an escape, and we we're not afraid of talking politics as it relates to Human Factors, right? We've mentioned on the show before, uh, sort of these issues with um, autonomous vehicles and uh, net neutrality is a big one for our field, especially. And so, it's not that we're afraid to talk politics; it's just that we're and. and Another thing, too, while I'm thinking about it, is that we are predominantly an American central uh, or centralized culture on the show. That's our point of reference. And so there are plenty of other politics that are going on in the world. And, um, you know, it, it may like I said, we have a worldwide audience and it may not make sense to somebody else who's on the outside looking in. So, again, Brian, thank you so much for writing in, because, again, when we record the show, it's just me and Blake back and forth. But. When you guys write in like this, it really nails it home that, oh, yeah, we have people that are listening to our show. Blake, I've been talking. My mouth is dry. Why don't you go and talk about your response to this while I grab (laughs) some water? You go get that water, man. So, again, Brian, I know we've said this 10,000 times, but really appreciate your writing in or participating in the Slack. It really helps us to make us want to keep going. Because like Nick just said, every time we record one of these, it's just me and him going back and forth. Like we put the work in and it's just us kind of riffing. Uh, so Nick gave some really good answers to kind of like why we avoid the brand name stuff. Um, and personally, from the politis- politics aspect, this is kind of a release for me to where this that's not like a, a problem here, right? Like, yeah, I think some of our opinions will sneak in, but this is this a uh, this is a place that I like to come talk to Nick about like what's going on in human factors or UX design or development. Just kind of, you know, a little bit of escapism for a Monday night, like getting away from the problems of the world sometimes. Um, but one comment that I made to you, I'm not sure if you saw it, was 
a big thing for me about not talking about the brand names is a lot of times when I don't mention them, it's because I've had a negative experience. Now, I'm sure a lot of people are like, well, why don't you tell us what company or what piece of software you use and that you had that negative experience with? Well, the truth is, is I'm not involved in that specific design process. So I don't know what even went on to amount to a design, right? And anybody out there that's working in this field or anything in technology, or really if you're just developing developing products, be it physical or software, you know it takes a lot of work, a lot of time, that blood, sweat, and tears that you've heard a thousand times. And I just don't think it does the world really a whole lot of justice to just say like, hey, I've had a really bad experience with these guys. They suck at design. They're not any good. Like they should, they should have done it this way. I just think there's too many variables for me that I don't understand from within the business or how they were designing. Um, and it's one of those things too, where you don't have somebody else in the room that represents that company or brand. Right. So I, I, I just don't like hating on people's stuff, like in a direct fashion like that. I, I would rather like try and spitball about like, oh, okay, kind of make things better this way or whatnot. And sometimes I don't even do that. My like emotional side gets the better of me. Um, but one thing I do try and do, and I know Nick talked a little bit a lot about this too, is I do try and shout out stuff that I think is awesome designs, whether it's coming from our stories, it's in our banner section, banter section, it's something I throw out on Twitter. Like I really do like the idea of like bolstering up good like user experience design or good work from a human factors perspective or research because I I don't know, that's the kind of stuff I want to promote um, versus like focusing too much on maybe the negativity in a problem. Um, but regardless, still really love the feedback from you guys, and especially you, Brian, really appreciate your writing in. Um, and now my mouth is dry, so I will be sipping some water. So Nick, it's your turn to get some next? water. You're not afraid to, or, or you don't want to call out bad uh, UI design unless it's uh, Star Wars Blu-ray menus. All right, so why don't we get into Human Factors News? This is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. This is where we talk about everything related to the field of Human Factors, from medical, transportation, psychology, virtual reality, whatever it is, as long as it relates to the field of Human Factors, it is fair game for us to talk about and give our spin on it. Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right, this week we've got some hackers in North Carolina were able to lock down several servers on a county government in with ransomware last week. So this actually locked local officials out of a computer system that manages inmate populations, child support, and social services. Uh, but despite outages, the county isn't planning to pay the 23 grand ransom demanded by the hackers. But in the meantime, county officials have been forced to revert to paper systems. Now, Nick, if we've mentioned this once, we've definitely mentioned it like two or three times. Cybersecurity is just going to continue to be a large issue. And, you know, I have to say in a government program like this, and this is pr this is pretty much local government, um, this is kind of kind of a serious attack from hackers if they were able to like you know lock down several servers that are impacting so many different services to a county yeah it just goes to highlight the importance of the human in cybersecurity, right this this ransomware um and for those who don't know ransomware is is something that will hijack your computer and basically say you have to pay this ransom uh before we release your computer to be used again and uh, oftentimes it's it's through the use of untracked currency such as gift cards or um, or Bitcoin. Uh, so it, the fact that I mean, the fact that it was recognized as an attack is the good news. Right. That means the human side of things is winning in this case. But the 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 software hardware side of things is not winning in this case. Well, yeah. Also, too, it sounds like to me that like having actual processes in place to deal with this kind of problem uh, are also not really there. Cause I mean, the, the best they could do was within the time frame, like just revert back to paper. Like there was no way to, there was no, it doesn't seem like there was a lot of just cyber security concerns put in place for like, okay, if something like this happens, here's what we can do. We have backup servers that can run and connect to the systems and at least get things up and running quicker. So we don't have to be reverting to paper because like the, the variations of the stuff that this uh, particular server lockout 
cause from like managing an inmate population to people getting child support. I mean, that's a lot of people being affected by basically one ransomware attack. Yeah, for sure. I'm curious to see what, you know, kind of bricks the IT department where they're were uh, shitting out, <laughs> you know, like cuz this is this is pretty serious, right? Especially if um if you're just minding your own business and then all of a sudden all the computers on the I don't know, did it say all the computers in the system were affected by this or was it just kind of like a um uh, a percentage of them? I'm looking now. To uh see. it's it just I don't know if it gets to specifics it just claims several servers, servers were yeah. like on lockdown yeah so that even so that's scary because um i well i'm not sure i'm not quite sure how the server interface operates and if that is literally just the it department dealing with that uh and you know the fact that they were locked down means that the the human interfaces on um the other side of the system were unaffected it I'm interested to see on that that side of the thing, uh, on that side of the coin, how that type of situation is handled, right? Where the server is attacked, but the the, the human side uh, is relatively untouched, and it just kind of um, results in a timeout, right? Yeah, I mean, this is this basically is hold, more or less holding data ransom. It seems right. like, uh, which which is still pretty pretty scary right and and i think you're you're right it would just basically result on a like oh we can't process your request from maybe like a front end side because it's it basically it says it here in the little blurb that i put in was that they were forced to like use paper systems now to go so kind of stepping backwards so i'm sure the front end is probably fine this is more so like we have all of this data uh stored away or that you can't access now um, so it probably is a lot of just the IT guys trying to figure out, like, okay, <laughs> how can we break into whatever ransomware these guys have put on our system? Or how? To, or maybe even the better question is, how did it get there in the first place? Yeah, scary stuff. I mean, we'll talk about this a little bit next week with uh, the predictions, right, that we made at the beginning of the year. Yes. Um, so that's just a little hint as to what we will talk about next week, uh, or as Blake and I will talk about tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Why don't we go ahead and get into this next story? Uh, this next story is pretty pretty hilarious to me. I hope everybody gets a chance to watch the video. But anyway, so the San Francisco Board of Supervisors voted to severely restrict the use of delivery robots that roll on sidewalks and autonomously dodge op- obstacles like dogs and buskers. In fact, even startups are now only permitted to run these robots in low traffic areas for research purposes, not actually making deliveries. So it's perhaps the harshest crackdown on delivery robots in the United States, which definitely seems odd in the city that gave us an app that sends someone to park your car for you. Man, Nick, I hope you had a chance to take a look at this giant delivery robot rolling down the street and the havoc that it seemed to cause. Because even though this is in San Francisco, like in the heart of Silicon Valley, where innovation seems to live at the moment... I could see why the board of supervisors are pulling these things off the streets. Yeah, you know, I haven't actually watched Wired's video, but I have heard uh, testimonials from friends in the area who have seen this thing rolling down the street and just has no blatant disregard for human safety. <laughs> so, Oh, wow, that's even... That's worse than what's in the video because the video, I guess, basically just shows it trying to the robot trying to get down basically a crowded street where somebody's busking, there's dogs, there's people in the way, and it just... It just like stops, starts and jolts every time it sees a different person. And it's almost like it can't really get at a, uh, get um, acclimated to its environment. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm watching it like, now. It looks like it's hitting a dog and um, trying to avoid people. But I mean, from from what I heard, one of my friends up there uh, basically said, you know, when it's coming towards you, it, it's kind of like that. um that whole awkward social moment where you are walking towards another person and you move left and they move left to anticipate your move and then you move right and they move right. And it just can't read human um, body language that well enough to sort of anticipate how you're going to move ahead of time. So, uh, you know, I I say blatant disregard for for human life, but (laughs) I was kidding because it's a robot (laughs) and everyone likes to play fun at that. But but yeah, I I think... um, Putting them in in uh, a, a less populated areas is, is the right step towards um, researching. To, you know, you got to go. You got to go smaller scale. 
to, to be able to scale up. And I think that's the right move. Although I'm playing devil's advocate here. I, I wonder if this is the wrong move. I wonder if, you know, just jumping into um, a fully populated environment will give them more data. And uh, like, I don't, I don't know if, you know, the uh, risks associated with this thing warrant the crackdown. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's definitely going to depend on the startup and what or the company that's running the delivery robots and then basically what algorithms they're using. Because something I found interesting is, of course, these are using a lot of different sensors, including like lasers, I think they mentioned. But for at least in the article, they don't name names, uh, but they do have a they do have human handlers behind a joystick. Right. In case something goes just incredibly wrong. Right. And the thing I was interested in trying to discern was, OK, well, how much of this is a human handler actually having to move the robot and how much of this is this robot being autonomous? Because um, I think that might give us a lot of information about, okay, what's really going on or, or the state of where the robot um, algorithm and machine learning processes are at. Uh, I really think that, so this is, this is kind of a flip side of the coin type of thing. I think this is a, a great thing. Not that they pulled the robots from the roads, but that they were being tested in high volume traffic areas. Cause how else are you going to discover just immediate problems like this right. for something as simple as basically a delivery robot um, I mean, it could. This gives them information about okay, how do I tweak the design? What can we do to enhance the algorithms? Or c can we give the robot like a better sense of like baseline data to start with? Uh, maybe, maybe from just these little tests, they actually got enough data to help them grow the algorithm over time. Um, but I do, I do worry a little bit that this is gonna stifle some of the innovation, like understand the need for the safety factor you don't want people getting hurt or animals getting hurt totally agree with that it's just uh, what Im i think it definitely will slow down the pro the progress that we're seeing with these kind of robots but again it uh it makes a lot of sense yeah that's my worry too is that the progress will be stifled yeah um, my cat but, doesn't like it either <laughs> no not having it uh, yeah. But who knows? Maybe it'll lead to better designs of robots uh, for this kind of use. Because to be honest, I think it was huge. Yeah, yeah it really it is. It was like a giant block on wheels. It really is. And yeah, I, yeah, we'll we'll just have to see what the future of robotics integrating with our society uh, has to hold. Um, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one? Uh, not really, except for I'm just glad to see this. This is kind of incredible to see robots rolling around on the street and then we're getting... Like people having to restrict them. I don't know. It's one of those things that it feels almost like the Jetsons a little bit. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if you saw it, but I posted on our Human Factors cast Twitter a couple weeks ago when I was up in San Jose. I actually saw one of those police bots uh, in the mall. Oh, are you serious? Yeah, I posted it on our Twitter. You can go check it oh, out. Oh, man. I'm going to have to go peek that thing. Yeah, that's awesome. Go look at it right now. <laughs> you got time. Oh, that's true. <laughs> But yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I think especially with you know these robotic peacekeepers and these uh, delivery robots, I think that you know the future is definitely we are we are definitely integrating these robots into our society, and the mere fact that we are establishing legislation and politics around them, uh, I think that's a good sign that while yes, this may be stifling the actual. Um, growth it is a step in the right direction in the fact that we are regulating this to where uh we are considering human safety as far as integrating these robots go couldn't agree more with you nick uh, did you find the picture i am scrolling through like our massive amount of pictures <laughs> <laughs> all right well why don't you go ahead and read the next story and i'll see if i can find it for you all right so this is good this is a kind of awesome one for me and Nick, although I'm a little late to the party. But anyway, so more and more, we see Sony supporting virtual reality and its flagship PSVR system with various games, accessories, and bundles hoping to convert us all to the immersive gaming platform. Well, in yet another push, Sony just announced an initiative aimed at those of us who haven't taken the plunge into VR yet. So a, as a way to try out the PlayStation VR in your own home, you can actually 
sign up for this, which unfortunately is a little bit closed. But of course, the demand was so high to try out the PSVR in your home for for 14 days that the site used to sign up has already reached the maximum number of users. Now, this is just a great step forward for VR in general. Um, definitely for gaming VR, of course, but just good to get like VR into people's homes, get them excited about it. Uh, maybe show them some of the applications of it, although a lot of this is game centered, and I'm not really sure like uh, what the you know span of games they have available for PSVR is. Probably as wide, I have no idea, but I I don't know. I think this is a great way for, of course, PlayStation to get their name out there as a giant player in the VR game, but also get more people exposed to it. Ah, so really quickly, I found out why you can't find it on our Twitter is because I posted it on my personal Twitter. Um, so hang on, let me send that to you there. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, let me talk about this PSVR thing really quick. So this is sneaky for a variety of reasons in terms of marketing, um, but I think it's good for VR. So let me explain here. So installation of these things can be really can be difficult. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily that difficult with the PlayStation VR, but there is this barrier to returning it if you've set it up and you've invested the time to set this thing up as a 14-day trial, right? And that, that'll probably take you a day uh, or, or half a day or what, you know, it doesn't really take that long, but I'm talking to about... To set it up or to take it down? Both. Um, oh my goodness, are you serious? Not not really half a day. I'm I'm saying like, if you don't know what you're doing, it'll probably take you one or two hours. Wow, okay. If you know what you're doing, it'll probably take you 30 minutes. So, with that being said, uh, that eats into your time where you have to uh, return it, right? So they send it to you. And then, so that's one barrier. And they might get that conversion where people say, eh, it's only $300. I'll just keep it. I doubt that'll be the case. But the second point I wanted to make is you have to really try virtual reality to appreciate what it is and what it does for scale. Um, I know when you tried virtual reality, Blake, you were kind of blown away by the scale of things. Right, you were looking up at the ATAT and said, "Wow, I didn't realize it was that big." Um, yeah, it was pretty incredible. Like, I, I don't know. I guess I was expecting something much less polished than what I saw, and it was they, that Star Wars VR experience really did blow me away. Especially like also looking around in the cockpit. But yeah, it's if you haven't tried it, I very much think that you should just give it a shot if your buddy's got it or something like that because it's a uh, it's a cool it's a cool way to experience like. I don't know, things like the Star Wars franchise or just uh, even the world around you. Yeah, so, I mean, like, some of your favorite franchises like uh, Doom VR, VFR, um, and, and like, you know, it, the the big barrier to virtual reality is both the price and getting it into the home to try it. Because of that, this, this PSVR trial program, I think, is going to be a really critical step and I feel like we'll see other manufacturers take note of this and implement some sort of um, competitive trial program where you can try the HTC Vive or whatever um, and have the option to purchase it afterwards. Uh, I, I think there was a real missed opportunity here so this actually comes with just uh, the, everything you need and a copy of Skyrim VR right? Um now, you can download a demo disc. That sounds weird, download a demo disc. But you download a demo game where you can go and sample a variety of different experiences. And honestly, uh, one of the launch titles, which was uh, Worlds, PlayStation VR Worlds, um, I think that's what it's called, that has a variety of different experiences that kind of let you know uh, when it's tailor built from the ground up, what the potential of VR is, and when you're just showing them one thing, Skyrim VR, which um, I'll be honest, the control scheme uh, could induce motion sickness more easily than some of the other games that I've mentioned on this demo disc, and so I think there's a real missed opportunity to get them in with these sort of um, sample experiences, right? Especially when they only have a 14-day trial. I don't know. I, I thought it was a missed opportunity, but 
Uh, who knows? There might be some documentation in there that says, here's where you can download it. But if it's on a physical disc, then it's just that much easier to just pop into your system and go. Yeah, I have to agree with you, Nick. That's what I thought when I saw the Skyrim being a part of it. Like, uh, I've loved and played a lot of different Skyrims through the years. But, I mean, as far as Sony trying to get this product out there, it seemed like they, with including just Skyrim, they're really targeting more of a top of like a hardcore gamer versus just like a variety of people. Whereas if they had gotten this VR worlds disc, maybe in, in uh, companion to this, that could have targeted more people. Or if like uh, people have young kids, if like you could have selected like uh, games that would have been meant for them, that kind of stuff. I, so I do think, or I agree with you at least that that was a missed opportunity as far as like the PSVR. Uh, I would love to see if they do, if they like publish any kind of follow up data from this, like uh, how many actually returned to them, if they collected why they returned to them, uh, just that kind of stuff. Because it would be. Like it is still a pretty steep price of like 300 bucks for the headset and stuff like that. But it'd be interesting to see who like really had adopted it or if Sony has a plan to like follow up with people to keep it and ask questions like, hey, what made you decide to keep the VR? Would you like about it if they use this kind of information to yeah. improve the product or maybe just talk about VR in general? I'd imagine so. At least some sort of sample. Um, well, do you have anything else to add to this one? Not to this one, man. I wish that I had known about it sooner because I would have loved to have tried it. But yeah. bummer. Hey, did you see that security bot? I oh, sent, no, I didn't. I sent you the link in the Skype there. See, Skype changed, and now it looks all crazy, and I don't know where things are. I sound like an old man. This is not good. It, uh, it, did not, it doesn't work. It don't work good. The Skype thing. You, Help me. Oh, oh. Hello, Westfield. <laughs> Westfield security robot. Yeah, Wait, that's cool. That's a security robot? What's the kid putting in it? He's he's just investigating. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Wow, this thing looks this looks very futuristic, like I might see it in Blade Runner. Doesn't this look like the Jetsons? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. This is nutty. Did uh, it talk? It didn't oh, talk. I have so many questions. I Holy know. Cow. It didn't talk. Uh, from the one, from what I saw, it didn't move. Although it looks like it has the potential to move, um, and theoretically, there's probably someone uh, on the other side looking for incidents. But um, <clears throat> before we move on to our next stories, uh, th I just want to thank all of our friends over at Engadget, Wired, The Next Web, IEEE Spectrum, and Gizmodo for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can follow us all over social, me uh, social media for links boing, to our original articles. Uh, or you can join us in our Slack where we post them a little early for you. All right, Blake, so I have to admit, these ones you picked out because I was on social media blackout. Um, so I'll need a little bit more help to break these down, although I am clicking on the links now. So go ahead. What's up next? All good, man. I'm really excited about these two, especially the first one we got up. So one of the toughest aspects of having epilepsy is not knowing when the next seizure will happen. So to help address this, IBM researchers have developed a portable and wearable chip that acts as a warning system detecting pre-seizure brain activity and alerting people to the onset of a possible seizure. So scientists have built the system on a mountain of brainwave, brainwave data collected from epilepsy patients to train their deep learning algorithms called neural networks. The algorithms learn to identify patterns of brain activity associated with the onset of seizures from this data set. Nick, you know I get super excited when I see these kind of like wearable healthcare applications of the technology that, we, that keeps coming out. And I just think this is a great application of you know, research and <laughs> integration with, I guess, deep learning is what they're calling it here with neural networks from IBM. I mean, just helping people with seizures be able to, you know, lead a little bit of more of a normal life by being able to be aware of potentially when they'll have another seizure is just incredible to me. And especially since this is done just by like a wearable that could be hopefully integrated into things like a Fitbit or you know, maybe even your cell phone, you know, at some point. But it's just a really awesome application of, you know, deep learning into healthcare. Yeah. So I'm wondering, is this wearable something that you just like tack onto your head? Because uh, it reads brainwaves, right? Yeah, it reads brainwaves. So I'm not quite sure about 
where it actually goes, if it's implanted or not. I don't think that it is. Uh, but again, th- for this particular uh, IBM research project, it's still like in concept phase. Uh, I think the problem was they were really trying just to tweak and under- make sure that the algorithms were really accurate because uh, they tested it on or they ran through it a lot of data um, to be able to make these kind of predictions. But yeah, this isn't out on the market. And I think right now it would have to be somewhere near your brain. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So it's it's using EEG data uh, to basically predict when people who have seizures will have a seizure. Um, now, I'm I'm thinking about the application. So this is great. But I'm thinking about the application of this to other things, right? Uh, oftentimes, technology is is um, created or or um, adapted to fit a need, and then it's often abstracted to other applications. So I'm thinking of something like uh, maybe precognition, right? Anticipating a user's intent using this chip and AI. Um, something like aug- augmented cognition, right? I'm not. I don't know a whole lot of augmented cognition i'm not in that domain but i know the concept of it and i know that this could uh sort of play into that right where um depending on what this chip is reading in your brain maybe it brings up the associated uh images on the screen or or something like that that's pie in the sky very much so but i i think it's it i think it's a it has plenty of applications just beyond this one. Oh yeah i think you're right i mean one that comes to mind just thinking about it is you know like how especially in things like air traffic control or um, even being a pilot right you have a lot of tools that are integrated into your workflow that make your work a lot easier and it allows you to you know pay attention to more like important aspects of it but something like this that was monitoring your brain waves could help with any kind of vigilance decrement uh, that comes along with the addition of automated tools. Oh yeah, that's to, a good one. To make sure that, hey, if, if this, if uh, if the user like ATC, whoever, their brain waves reach a certain threshold, maybe we like pop something up on their screen that uh, alerts them to like, hey, just making sure you're paying attention, or go take or, a break. Like you said just really kind of anticipating, maybe not even just user intent, uh, but what's going on on the screen, like combining that with okay. The person's thinking about this is re- this is really getting out there, but this is the person's brave brain waves out out reading that I'm getting. This is what's going on on their screen. Some kind of like interlocking between that. Let me help them make decisions. So it could even right. create better decision making. Provide tools. some sort of low level automation to help them with their task. Yeah, yeah, I think that's cool. Um, so honestly, I don't have a whole lot to talk about on this one, but uh, the the potential is definitely there and interesting to see what will happen with this one yeah most definitely i want to see like what the actual proof of concept yields because like i said this this has not actually been released it hadn't even been tested on humans but based on the data set that it's been given from i think like 16 16 years worth of you know brain scans especially for those that do have seizures uh it does make pretty accurate um pretty accurate calls with regard to like, is this particular set of activity going to lead to a seizure? So could improve a lot of lives and could have like Nick's talked about a lot of wide applications too. Yeah. Uh, Hey Blake, I just thought of something and I wanted to get your opinion on it because we record tomorrow for our pre-recorded episode. I was wondering what you thought of maybe potentially going through all of the stories of the year, all of them just kind of recapping and, and maybe, uh, talking about some of them in the context of the entire year, and maybe that let's can... do it. I ah, think that would be insane. It would be insane, but I, I like it. So yeah, that's that's next week on the show. We are going to go through every story that we covered this year, as well as our predictions for next year, and uh, go over our predictions in the context of all the stories this year. So, um, and you know, if we have time, we'll get to our mailbag stuff. I think that's a better plan. Most definitely. See, we make stuff up on the fly here at Human Factors Cast, but it's yes, all <laughs> it's all to make a better show. All right, let's get into our last story of the week, Blake. All right, guys. So just like we do, Elon Musk also likes to make predictions, and you may be familiar with some of them. So, like we're ha- we're living in a computer simulation, or that Tesla will surpass surpass Apple's market cap by twenty twenty five 
or the more recent humans can make Mars inhabitable by blasting it with nukes. But in a recent talk, Musk at Musk's startup Neural Neuralink, he made yet another prediction that AI is probably going to kill all of us. So further claiming that all efforts to make AI safe or maybe a five to ten percent chance of ex- of succeeding. Man, as many bright ideas as this guy comes up with, he definitely has a dark and, to me, a bit scary view of what AI will bring to us. He's been watching too much Black Mirror, which comes back later this month. Hey, Black Mirror plug, guys. Hey, Black Mirror plug. Um, <laughs> I So <laughs> you thought this was banter worthy, and uh, it's it's always fun to talk about, and this will be, what, is this our last story of the year? Uh, this is the last story of 2017, my man. That's crazy. Uh, yeah, that's that's crazy. So you're ending us off with AI is going to kill us all. You put together the show notes this week. I'm I did. You. I did, and I thought this was hilarious. So <laughs> no, I thought we could have like a fun conversation about this because it, it's one of those where honestly, Nick, I don't know where I stand on it because and this is kind of the point that part of the article makes. It's very very short and not very informative about what happened. But I mean. If Okay, so by his merits, Elon Musk has brought a lot of great things regarding technology to the planet, for sure. Very smart guy, obviously intelligent, very eccentric. I mean, that's typical of somebody that's a genius, right? But is it worth trying to understand his perspective on AI? But then again, let's flip that coin. Why does everybody else not really seem to be on the same train as him like facebook or other big other big companies like there's just this obviously big dichotomy between what people think ai is capable of and then what others think and then i have no idea really the true power of it yeah so you don't know right now yeah i have no idea i am under the impression that unless we program it to become sentient and and uh self-aware then it won't get to that point and uh you know we'll always have power over it uh so it's it's funny to see him freak out over this uh only only in the sense that he's a smart guy and he can definitely figure out a way but knowing that he's still scared so i don't i don't know what to make of this well okay here's here's kind of how i make of it right okay so he is scared But his reaction is not just to be scared and tell people about it. It's to go and develop this specific startup that's trying to develop some kind of neural lace that allows you to control that integration with, you know, technology and the transfer of data from your brain to other entities. Right. So I I think that's kind of his answer to it is trying to design something that protects humans in the long run from his perspective. And, you know, I. I get I totally get the idea that, OK, if we if we only program the machine to know these things or to feel this way like that, that's always worked in our past. But I think we're really on the cusp of with machine learning and neural networks and then what will eventually become true AI. I think we're getting beyond only ever just programming the machine to do something. I think at some point they're going to be able to start learning, especially as like things like chips in the brain like bcis like we become bigger where we're sharing networks of information um much more openly like kind of in that high mind sense so i think is and then the other part to think about it or the the ray kurzweil in me i think about this all the time like this kind of technology doesn't grow at a normal rate it grows exponentially Uh, it's just like computer chips same same type of principle. So I, I don't know. That's that's why I don't really know what to think of this, because uh, my rational brain says like you just you just did. You program the machine what it learns. That's what we've found out from those different like Twitter bots that go out there and become racist. Like it, you're giving it specific data. It's gonna feel a specific way or project a specific right. set of values. Um, but what if that's not always the case? Yeah, it, it, you know this reminds me. <laughs> so I was watching The Office last night. Uh, and it was that episode where uh, Dwight tries to outsell the computer for uh, paper sales. Yes. And it's uh, Jim and Pam messing with him to make him think that the computer just became sentient. 
<laughs> and it, it's funny that I was watching that as, you know, you dropped this story. So <laughs> it's just very relevant. I don't know, man. I I don't know. I still think we have the power and as if if we think that we don't have the power, it'll almost be like self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, where we will <laughs> find a way um to back us into a corner where we can't get out of. That's kind of where I'm at with it. Yeah, I mean it makes sense and also always depends on the intent of the people designing it, right? Like uh, at some point AI I think will become like the internet so you can use it in the ways that you see fit to and in everybody's hands that'll be different. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't we round it out uh this week and get into it came from Reddit. We got time for one Blake. One of them. Time for one. Oh my goodness. So you're going to have to pick it this week. All right. All right. Uh, Okay. So the first one's kind of loaded, so it'll answer a couple of questions. So let's do that. You want to go with one? All right. Yeah, let's go with one. So this is titled Need Advice on UX slash UI Design from the User Experience subreddit from Nips Ariel. (laughs) Oh, good. I should definitely screen some of these (laughs) names. Nips Areola. All right. Taking you seriously. God. Yeah. All right. So, uh, <laughs> all right. So I've been researching UX UI for a couple months now, and I finally think this is the career for me. I'm an undergrad senior who is majoring in marketing and will be taking next semester off, which means I have some time to learn UX UI and build my portfolio. Also, I have some experience with graphic design, Photoshop, etc. Uh, but I'm definitely still amateur, so I have a few questions. What are the best sources uh, to self-learn for UX and UI, specific books, articles, YouTube, video, boot camps, etc., uh, between a computer science major or, or computer science minor or creative media and digital technology minor a program that focuses on the relationship between human uh, humanity and technology? Which one? Uh, which one should I pursue? Also, is the extra semester or two for the minor worth it? Or will graduating early in a marketing degree be enough to break through the industry? I would love your opinion and thoughts on this. Just trying to get some insight on everything before I go all in. Okay, Blake, let's break this down question by question. Because there are, what, three here? Yeah, Yeah. there's three. Okay, Okay. so what are the best sources to self-learn for UX and UI specifics, books, articles, YouTube videos, boot camps, etc.? Oh, man. All right, Nick. So this is up to you if you want to do this, but to help out the rest of the listener base, it might be helpful if we also talk about it from a human factors perspective. Uh, that's kind yeah. of up to you. It doesn't really answer this guy's question in particular, but I can I can riff a little bit on some of the like places to self-learn. Um, sure. Honestly, books-wise, th- <sighs> there's so much out there. Uh, th- look, just- up a, look up a best UX books list and you'll be good. Yeah, the one that I would recommend, especially since like since you're like much newer to the field, really only have the graphic design skills, is there's a book called literally the UX book, and it just it does a really good job of not focusing on necessarily like building designs, but the methodology that you would get like from a human factors course about usability and process, like that's a really good book. So the UX book definitely a good place to check out article wise there's okay so uxdesign.cc puts out a newsletter every week of all like a bunch of aggregated ux articles throughout the week i mean it's always really really current about what's going on in ux what's going on in terms of design for like voice uis and ai like it's just it's a great place to go so uxdesign.cc for sure youtube ah i don't really know one off the top of my head but if you're like into learning from videos just definitely search ux tutorials in youtube and see what you get but udemy is also a really great place they have a a bunch of different like ui or even like methods courses you can check out um but yeah that's that's kind of all i got for the self-learn stuff just keep keep hacking at it start off with the basics like we just talked about and you know you'll find more stuff as you go yeah, I'm right with you there, Blake. For specific books, I always, you know, the design of everything. Things like the the basic, most basic UX human design books you can find. Literally, any list will give you a good uh, sort of overview. If you don't know how to Google, uh, you're in the wrong field. I will say, in terms of uh, 
articles, if you're looking for something targeted at UX, uh, the the sources that Blake listed are pretty good. Uh, I would expand that and say I really like the sources that we use for this show uh, in Gadget Wired, Next Web, IEEE Spectrum, Gizmodo. Uh, what else do we use? Um, Recode, we use. I said the Next Web. Uh, I, I'm trying to think of some of our other ones that we frequent. Um, we use Wired pretty we, frequently. We use Wired as well. And Fast Company. Fast Company's got a great uh, design center set of pages too so that's another way to go yeah and that's a reason why we we uh called them out on the show is so that you guys our listeners can go and actually you know find the sources yourself we also post the links in the show notes uh youtube video um i don't really know for that one i will say podcast there's a human factors cast podcast that's really good you can listen to that uh, <laughs> boot camps. I heard it's one of the best. You know, in terms of video, I will say lynda.com actually has a lot of really good stuff for human centered design uh, classes. I like loaded up my LinkedIn with all the because you can link them, right? You can link your LinkedIn to your Lynda account and, and just like all the classes that you took. And this was back when I was like really learning a lot. Um, you know, you, you can link all those certificates to your <laughs> LinkedIn account. So I really like Linda. Uh, that's good. Uh, any of those free online universities uh, probably teach you something worth worth noting. Um, I haven't been to any boot camps myself. Okay, we got a couple minutes here, Blake. So between a computer science major or so, uh, sorry, this is these are minors. Compu- between a computer science minor or a creative media and digital technology minor program that focuses on the relationship between humanity and technology which one should i pursue blake what are your thoughts on this so nick i'm gonna kind of go off the rails for this one a little bit and include the second question with this because i think they kind of jive together uh that's not off the rails at all that is that is that is we're on a maglev train now oh yeah making it smooth man let's go so the second part of uh the the second question that i'm going to include with this is also it's an extra semester or two for a minor worth it or graduating early with a marketing degree be enough to break through in the industry. Okay. With regards to which minor you should pick, honestly, man, that really, or man or lady depends. Don't really know. Nips areola. Uh, yeah. Mm, I want to say it's dude, but anyway, Probably. <laughs> uh, so between computer science and creative media, media and digital technology, that's an interesting minor because the way you describe it sounds a little bit, like human factors like the diff- or how human humanity interacts with technology so that might be cool but really those two depend on what you want to do uh, it sounds like maybe from the media and digital technology that might really get you some more graphic design skills which you talked about having uh, if you're interested in actually building products or since it's a minor uh, computer science might be helpful for interfacing with developers having a little understanding of how they talk or concepts that they might throw around in meetings so it might give you a leg up uh, if it was up to me, I'd say computer science minor. But again, it depends on what you want to do. Uh, rolling into the second piece, is it worth it? Only you can really answer that question, to be completely honest. I would say it is Pop because out. both of those are just really great options to me, sounds like. Um, and if I hate to say this, and I'm going to try and put it in the best way I can, but if you want to break into the industry, it's really going to mean you need to put a pretty pretty comprehensive portfolio together to show that you understand the concepts so maybe staying in school and getting a minor and trying to take like additional classes whether it's stuff online that we've talked about or if your uh, particular school has something specific to ux or maybe graphic design um, interlaced with some of your computer science stuff i would say your best bet is to stay in school And if especially if you want to try and jump into UX, maybe try and find an internship uh, as you're leaving school to really get you some work experience. But I would say you want to try and apply the things, you know, to like a UX, like a user experience problem, whether it's like designing a site or a mobile app. Um, But yeah, Nick, what do you think? So are you ready for unpopular opinion time? Yes, I am. So, okay, let's see here. So the questions are uh, computer science minor creative media and digital technology minor uh blake your answer was it depends on you i say it <clears throat> it also depends <laughs> it's the motto of the show right uh, okay so in, in in okay i'm gonna answer both of them at the same time too you are right because this makes more sense uh is the extra semester worth it no 
It all depends on how you spin your work that you've already done. If you are if you are able to build a compelling portfolio with the work that you have already done, in the context of yes, this was a management or or a uh, what is their major here a marketing uh, a marketing project, but. Look, here are the steps that I took. I made sure I included the users in this. I made sure I designed for a specific demographic. Um, it's all about how you spin it. And while it might look a little better in the long run to have a minor that says, look, I've had classes on this, nothing speaks louder than your ability to communicate your skills on your portfolio. So while I think both of those would probably be a really good venture for you to go out and do and, and get your experience that way, like I said, nothing speaks louder than your ability to communicate your skills to the people who are potentially going to hire you. So uh, uh, of everything, that's what I would focus on. That's this my... is why I love doing a show with you, Nick Rome. That was an excellent way to look at it. I mean, like, it, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter as long as you can spin it. It's all about how you spin your experiences. And uh, as long as you possess the ability to spin it in a way that's going to be relevant to the job that you are looking for. And for marketing, if you have any experience in it, like outside of just getting a degree or even like just doing projects, you have some skills that are related to the field for sure. Already. I mean, you do market research. Look, you deal with other people. Like, that's a yeah. big part of our job. You deal with other people. You have uh, design for or, or, you know, design campaigns, marketing campaigns specifically towards a demographic. Like, there, there are all these little bits and pieces that you can pull out from the stuff that you've done in marketing and say, look, I've, I, I can do it. I can do it. And it's just about getting that entry level job so that you can build up that experience. Okay, Blake, do you have anything else to add? That's it. Best of luck. All right. Take that, Nips Areola. All right. So that's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of our last stories of 2017. Did you like them? Did you hate them? Let us know. If you guys have any suggestions for 2018 topics or news stories you want us to cover, you can follow us all over social media. Join the discussion on our Slack. Link is in the show notes for that. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. Check out our SoundCloud. You can also leave us a comment over there. Uh, or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're feeling saucy, you can leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901 646 one HFC as in Human Factors Cast. You can also support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash human factors cast. We always like it when you give us money. Uh, like I said, we bring these things to you ad free. If you don't want to do that, that's okay. I completely understand. We just ask that you go and like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. Those always help us out too. Help spread the word of Human Factors Cast. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Blake Arnsdorf, thank you so much for helping me round out the year with all these stories. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to ask you advice about how to break into the UX field? Oh, man. You guys can always find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. And thank every last one of you that have ever listened to the show or are listening right now for a wonderful 2017. And I can't wait for the next one. Here's to another one. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time. It, it depends. depends. That was a good one. Last it depends 2017. 2017. Just want an excuse to say nips areola one more time. <laughs>